ecstatic to have our new executive here tonight, Chris Costa, who is going to lead us into the future and into the movement to the new museum because we are really turning the page and moving in a new uh, and interesting direction uh, uh, under Chris's leadership. So a little bit about Chris. Uh, he is, uh, it's amazing that you were able to transition as quickly. I thought you probably need a year of vacation after his last job, uh, which was serving as a special assistant to the President of the United States and Senior Director for Counterterrorism on the National Security Council. Uh, and he finished this job in February um, after a year at the NSC. And at the NSC, he was responsible for coordinating counterterrorism policy and strategy, as well as, and I think this is kind of cool, U.S. hostage recovery operations around the world. Before the National Security Council, he was with the United States Special Operations Command, U.S. SOCOM, as Program Director in the Operations Directorate. And before that, he served as the Department of the Navy Civilian at the Navy, see, I, I'm going to want to say with, you know what, I'm going to do the Navy Special Warfare Development Group, also called as DEB Group. Now, I'm going to let you look it up on your own, because Chris doesn't like when I say what the popular term for DEV Group is. Uh, but this is the U.S. Navy SEALs, a particular team. Uh, and a senior adjunct instructor with Norwich University's Bachelor of Science and Strategic Studies and Defense Analysis program. At Norwich, he taught classes in a lot of different subjects, including national security strategy and counterterrorism. And if you want to know how this seemingly nice-looking, uh, well-buttoned-up civilian is regarded by the uh, special operations community, in May of 2013, Chris was inducted into U.S. SOCOM's Commando Hall of Honor for extraordinary and enduring service to Special Operations Forces. So we welcome you here tonight. Thank you for coming downstairs uh, to be involved in this program. And really what we want to do is talk a little bit through your career. Because your career spans decades, not to age you, uh, but you know we're going back uh, into the 1980s when you began your career. But what's, I think what I want people to pay attention to most importantly is the bookends of your career. And something that we want to understand more about the Spy Museum is that intelligence operates at so many different levels. And a lot of times we get fixated on the president being the top consumer of intelligence. The president needs to know everything. But me, as a non-commissioned officer in the Army, I cared a whole lot about intelligence at the tactical level. So we'll get into that and we'll move forward. So let me, let me ask you, let me begin with your origin story, the superhero origin story here about what got you into this world. Because you made some very particular choices uh, and, and a path that some people may recognize as similar to their own, and others may say, oh, okay. It's interesting how we got there. I never would have thought of that. So talk a little bit about what got you into this world of intelligence. So uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Very much appreciate it. And uh, it's exciting to be able to share some of my story with, with folks that support the museum. So that said, it's a pretty simple story. It started out um, in 1972 when I watched the uh, Munich Games live on TV and I saw a hostage situation and that planted a seed. I watched it play out. Who would have thought 9-11 we would watch that play out live many years later? But I was fascinated about, about the idea of countering terrorism, even as an 8 or 10 year old. Uh, that was the first trigger event for me. And uh, secondly, I read a book about the CIA and I didn't appreciate fully the nuance in the book, but I loved the, the mission of the book or the, the mission that was represented in the book. I love the stories and I love the core work. So those two ideas and the fact that I knew I wanted to serve in the military, that all came together. You had never intended for a career in the military or a career in intelligence. You're, you, you, like many people, were using it as a, thought you were being using it as a stepping stone to perhaps a job down the street at the FBI or the Massachusetts State Police or something in law enforcement. Yeah, I, I actually was fascinated with the idea of joining the Massachusetts State Police. I was a criminal justice major, and I figured I would go into the Army, spend a few years, and uh, once I was branched into the infantry and became a rifle platoon leader, I said, you know what, I want to go into the intelligence community, or I want to go exit the Army and become a state trooper. But it always in my mind was the idea that I'm I'm still interested in this intelligence community thing. Even as an infantry officer, you find yourself doing an informal type of intelligence, but an incredibly important type of intelligence. So I was in the 101st Airborne Division. That was my first assignment as a rifle platoon leader. And uh, ultimately, I grew into the scout platoon leader for the battalion. And that gave me the opportunity, first opportunity, really, to be an intelligence collector. 
because you collected battlefield intelligence and it was uh, tremendously rewarding because you saw the fruits of your labor in a tangible way. You went out, collected intelligence, and you provided that intelligence directly to a user, which was a battalion commander, the boss, getting ready to move maybe an infantry battalion across the forward lines of troops or to some phase line, and he had to know exactly what was ahead of him. So we spent time, sometimes on motorcycles, sometimes dismounted ahead of the, the battalion collecting intelligence on the battlefield. Well, you would eventually get a branch transfer to intelligence work. Is that the first time you ran into some concepts of counterterrorism instruction where you started learning about, you know, those that have been in the military might understand that there are really two U.S. armies. There's the big U.S. Army with the tanks and the airplanes and the helicopters that was training to fight the Soviets across the Folda Gap in Germany. And then in the late 70s and 80s, there was the army that was training to fight in El Salvador and in Panama eventually and fight the, 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 the counterinsurgency, counter guerrilla forces. You wanted to lean in that direction. Yeah, that's exactly right. So the big army focused on the weapons, equipment, organization of the Soviet Army from uh, team level all the way up to big armies. You knew the weapons, as I said, and all the equipment. Uh, that said, it was interesting, it was really important, but for me, I like the peripheries. I like the idea of this thing called low intensity conflict, and at the time it was ongoing in Central America, and that's where I wanted to go, because I thought that was an opportunity to study counterinsurgency, and I had studied counterterrorism at a very basic level, and that's really what appealed to me. But it goes back to those triggering events that I shared. So I went to Central America instead of where my peers went, which was mostly Western Europe, Germany. Well, and, and, and that had to take some guts, because in the Army at the time, and arguably the Army today, the path to promotion is not necessarily through intelligence, and certainly not through that small, counter guerrilla army. It's, it's to be a tank battalion commander, as your former boss was at the NSC. It, it's to fight against the Soviets. That's how you become a general. Um, did you understand that at the time? Was that something you were thinking about and considering? Or are you like, you know what, I just want to do this? Yeah, Vince is getting to a really important point. So the big army was for an intelligence officer. You didn't want to go into human you didn't want to go into counterintelligence, and you certainly didn't want to go into special operations. So those three areas would be a kiss of death, really, for your career. And all three of those areas appealed to me. So at the time, I was young, and I was going to be a state trooper, right? That was my plan. So I wanted to have fun and do what I thought was important work, um, tactical work, and it allowed me to be in the field and actually conduct operations rather than report on operations. And that really had a strong appeal to me. So that's what I chased. And uh, my advice all along the way to other lieutenants and other peers, and as I got more senior, was, was always the same and it was consistent. Do the best you can in whatever job you're in, as simple as that might sound. And the rest will work out for you from a career standpoint. So doing, doing counterintelligence work, doing counterterrorism work, doing the kind of counter guerrilla work, uh, working in intelligence period uh, is very cerebral. Uh, not, not to take, I'm, I'm an ex-tanker, I'm allowed to make fun of our own people. We don't need to be a rocket scientist to be on tanks, but there is a lot of thinking involved in there. And obviously, as your career has taken off, you've been in jobs where you've had to have a very high level of understanding of history, of the world around you. Uh, you you've been a professor at Norwich University. Did that love of learning and the kind of books you had to read and the understanding of the world, did that start around this same time or did that something you build up to as you move forward? I absolutely built up to that, that there was a learning, a self-learning that went along with all this. Nobody in my elementary school, none of my educators would have said that Chris is going to be a really <laughs> smart guy. Um, that said, uh, I, I recognize that a competitive advantage, even as a young lieutenant, was to read and understand your profession. And I started buying books, and I started reading those books, and I started sharing them. And there's no original idea, operational concepts, and I think we'll talk about some of that. Uh, it's just concepts that have played out in history, and you adapt those concepts from your reading, and you can apply it on the battlefield, and you can certainly apply it for intelligence operations as well. So. Let's talk about your first uh, almost accidental foray into you know, kind of combat arena. Uh, you're, you're in El Salvador, as you mentioned. Uh, 
Uh, and, and this is the 1980s, and if, if people remember, in the late 1980s, there was a bit of a skirmish down in Central America. Um, but you weren't in Panama except for, you just happened to go down there on what day? 19 December, 1989. And that's important because? Because that's the night uh, Operation Just Cause, the operation to secure Manuel Noriega and to kick off a, a massive, at the time, combat operation. That wasn't somewhere you were assigned to. You That's had right. no idea right. what you were walking yourself into. Well, actually, on reflection, I had a little bit of an idea, but I called my wife, Donna, and I said, don't worry, don't pay attention to what you're seeing on TV. Nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the Prussian intelligence officer yeah. got it absolutely wrong as I flew down to brief my brigade commander on the unit status report, something really basic. I had spit polished jungle boots and wasn't prepared for combat operations that ensued. So this is an interesting picture here, talking about books and other things. You, you want to tell a little bit of behind this story about how surprised you were to be in the situation you were in? So I was so surprised that I was going to execute combat operations or participate in combat operations. I had a billet. You know, I was in a room at a BOQ, an officer um, quarters, and I went to the PX very quickly because the PX was open uh, because it was just a few hours and it was relatively secret that the operation was going to kick off. So I bought a book on, on Panama and I uh, left my wife a note, uh, which soldiers are wont to do um, in case, uh, you know, something bad happened. And uh, then we went off to war, which was just a couple miles away. We went to our battle positions and uh, the operation kicked off in earnest around midnight or a little after midnight that night. So you, you weren't an infantry officer anymore. You were a counterintelligence right. officer at this point. So what was the job of a counterintelligence officer in Panama during this time? And I'll even... Yes, so the operation was essentially twofold for us. It was to, for, first of all, to help track these are the early days of man hunting, battle tracking, and understanding the principles of finding somebody that needed to be secured on the battlefield. And that individual was General Noriega. And everybody was focused on not only uh, shutting down the Panamanian Defense Forces, anyone that would take up arms against U.S. service members, but at the same time we had to talk to everybody we possibly could to identify where is Noriega that night? Where was he last? Where is he moving to? What's the order of battle? who are going to raise arms against us, who is, um, what's the order of battle look like as it plays out on the battlefield, who's friendly, who's foe. And we had to separate the civilians from the Panama Defense Forces that were suggesting they were civilians, but they had just changed out of their uniform. So that's a classic counterintelligence mission on a battlefield, and it played out uh, for several re weeks uh, in Panama as we try to sort out friend from foe. Is that it was extremely seeing, complicated. Is that what we're seeing in this picture? Yeah. Or? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a day or two into the, in, into the actual invasion. I'm at the Comandancia, which is the Panama Defense Force headquarters. We were still under fire there. Uh, it was obviously not too dangerous. We had security, but our job was to identify, again, those pieces of battlefield intelligence that might lead us to Noriega, or we might find some nugget. That plays out all over the battlefield today, from Iraq to Afghanistan, uh, where we have forces to identify. Uh, I think we call it um, site exploitation. That's exactly what we were doing here. So Noriega clearly wasn't in his office sitting behind his desk because Someone else was in his office sitting behind his desk. Well, I didn't know you were going to show that. <laughs> so in hindsight, I should have kept that hat, and I didn't. Uh, but uh, yep, I think everybody that rolled into the Comandancia had to demonstrate that they sat at Noriega's desk. So I'm not the first person that had an opportunity to sit there in a lull in, in, our, uh, in our work. And you can see some of that work right in front of me there. The Rangers got to the Comandancia before I did, clearly, and they were looking for immediate battlefield information as they rolled from target to target, which is important because those lessons we learned in, in Panama, and I know there are people here that understand that, um, played out in uh, post 9-11. You know, you go to one site on the battlefield and that takes you to the next site based on the information that you exploit uh, in a tactical environment. So we were, uh, yeah, not exactly with that <laughs> cowboy hat, but uh, we were, that's what we were in the process of doing that night. How closely were you working with 
other branches of the military during the Panama invasion, and then, of course, the civilian intelligence contingent at this time. Because this has been the first, no offense to anyone who was in Grenada, but Grenada was not necessarily a full-fledged combat operation. Uh, so the first major combat action since Vietnam. And there's been a, essentially a generation since that time. How well did you have joint operations during this time? Because Grenada, they weren't very good. And how well did the civilians work with the military folk? So joint special operations and special operations forces were all over Panama during this operation. Navy SEALs, there were several Navy, Navy SEAL casualties, uh, in, sadly, in, in Panama. So the joint special operations community, they were war working very well together. Based on lessons learned in Grenada, which is the previous invasion that took place a few years before. So the special operations were the first ones really to, to um, refine how to operate in the battlefield and, and to do the coordination required to move very quickly. But so wasn't the interagency. This is my first exposure to working operationally very closely with CIA in Panama, close quarters, working with them in the building and sometimes going back to the headquarters in Corozal, a few miles away, and consolidating. So these were nascent, these were first steps at coordination. Um, and, and later we, we continued learning those lessons. Well, the CIA knew Noriega very well. That's you right. You don't need to answer that question. Sorry. That was... <laughs> um, before you left Honduras um, and, and joined the, your next stage in your career, um, you had a, maybe your first personal experience with terrorism. Uh, you know, you talk about Munich and being that kind of an early age influence on what you wanted to become. But your, your first opportunity, and I'm using that word probably the wrong way, uh, to see firsthand how terrorism could affect our lives. Can you talk a little bit about the two people that you knew relatively well or knew of who were touched by terrorism long before the rest of us were really starting to appreciate it? Yes, yeah, so the first day I arrived in Honduras, there was an attack where we were uh, headquartered in Sotocano. It was a simple attack, nobody was hurt, but uh, a left-wing terrorist organization uh, took a shot trying to you know, induce a U.S. casualty. So we were very much exposed to the left-wing terrorist groups, the movements that played out in Central America, an extension of what was happening across the border in Nicaragua and what was happening with the FMLN. I don't remember what that acronym stands for, but it was a, a uh, insurgent movement of left-wing terrorists and insurgents operating in El Salvador. So. Um, we were exposed to the left-wing side of the terrorist group, not religiously inspired, but uh, those were the experiences that, after going through schooling, that I wanted to better understand. So that happened, and we lived under that threat, which seems relatively minor in hindsight, but it wasn't because it was lethal. Had two, uh, two friends the, right before I left, actually two seniors, and we had a farewell. And that night, interestingly, one of them was Colonel Dave Pickett, uh, we had a great celebration that night, and another colonel by the name of David Hallams. And uh, Pickett was shot down in El Salvador shortly thereafter, uh, flying a little lower than he probably should have, and he survived the actual crash of the helicopter in El Salvador, and he was executed by the FMLN. And Colonel Hallams shared with us that night that his roommate was assassinated by the FMLN in El Salvador. It just reinforced that the terrorism dynamic was alive and well, and it touched me early on in my career, and that, that planted the seed of uh, not just you know, the lethality of, of terrorism as a tool, but it gave me exposure to a side of terrorism that, that would provide me some learning that would help me post 9-11. Well, after that point, you moved on to working in the true special operations community as being part of the legendary 10 Special Forces. And if you don't know anything, they, they, uh, there's a great book in the back, uh, if you're interested, uh, about this unit that prior to this time uh, had spent the vast majority of their period uh, in the Cold War setting themselves up as what are called left behinds. If World War III had started and the Russians had crossed the fold of gap, they were there to cause havoc, like, much like the SOE in World War II, like set Europe ablaze. And this is an organization that had that kind of history that you were joining. How much of a kind of a baptism into the special operations community was that for you? 
Well, it was, it was a terrific baptism because when you went to 10th Special Forces Group, they were sort of the guardians of how to build an underground. And that was the, war, the mission that you just alluded to during the Cold War. And we, uh, I just come back from Panama and 10th Special Forces didn't deploy a lot except for uh, set paced exercises because they were poised to fight in the Warsaw Pact. But what they had and what I learned from the non-commissioned officers, the Special Forces Green Berets assigned to that unit is I learned the importance of building a network and we exercised how to build networks. And as an intelligence officer, I was responsible for peace of that and to work very closely with the Special Forces non-commissioned officers. Now somebody, I'm not going to point them out, but somebody grimaced here when we talked about 10th Special Forces. Just for the record, it's because he grew up in 5th Special Forces, so there's a <laughs> bit of a rivalry. So, so uh, what, what I thought was interesting is this is a time period where you're getting baptized into Special Operations. We'll skip through Desert Storm because 10th Special Forces had a somewhat unique experience in Desert Storm, mainly afterwards. But I want to juxtapose that with your time in Belgium, because after Desert Storm, you saw that other side of the intelligence world, more the kind of the civilian, big picture, big army Cold War side, when you're attached to a very large headquarters involved with essentially the entire operations of Europe. And this is where it's almost like traditional counterintelligence work. You've been doing special operations and counterinsurgency stuff, and now you're kind of, I don't want to say with the big boys, but you're, you're doing it in a much more traditional way. Yeah, so in Belgium, as a young captain, I was very fortunate as a counterintelligence agent to work operationally and on both investigations and counterintelligence in, in, uh, operations. So both sides of the coin of counterintelligence, and it was a great exposure. I saw firsthand the, the pain of being burned by a foreign agent. In this case, it was the East Germans. There was a penetration of NATO. and. Uh, the woman that I had to interact with in the office of uh, NATO Office of Security, of Security in particular, her husband was the penetration. He was actually the spy, the East German recruited asset. At the time, I think, it was the highest ranking East German penetration of NATO. And we knew somewhere in NATO there was a spy, and we just needed to identify where that spy was. And I had to understand what was the impact on our military planning for Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe. So that's a mouthful, but the bottom line is everyone, peace was breaking out in Europe, the wall had fallen down, but we knew that the enemy at the time, from an intelligence service standpoint, they were still working against us, the Russians. We were trying to sort out you know, what was happening with the, with the decline or the fall, actually, at the time of the Soviet Union. And we had access to some of the, the records of, and the files from East Germany. So we were trying to sort out where are these penetrations? What's the impact on our war planning? So I had really a, a, a front seat, not only investigations, but again, operations to really explore that as a very young captain. And I worked operationally in five different NATO countries to include working closely with those foreign partners. Is this your first opportunity to work with multinational organizations, not only military, but civilian as well? No, because I did a little of that during, uh, during Operation Provide Comfort post-Desert Storm. When we were working with the, the Kurds, we worked for very closely, I'm sorry, very closely with the um, with the Turks as partners. So I'd already had some exposure, but at the time NATO had 16 different countries, and each one of those countries had an intelligence service and a counterintelligence service. So I had the opportunity to work with many of those countries. So we're going to skip ahead a couple of years, not because of time, but literally because we can't talk about certain things in the <laughs> mid-1990s. So. When we met, we, we sat down and had a conversation, and, and there's one of these weird instances where uh, the two of us in 1998 uh, spent about six months, about 20 minutes from each other and had no idea. Uh, even if we had met, you were a lieutenant colonel or something, and I was not. Um, we probably would not have interacted other than me going, yes, sir, no, sir. Uh, but in the Balkans, uh, in the late 1990s, you were operating a little north of me, uh, but both of us had relatively similar experiences, and I think that... Uh, people may underappreciate how important our operations in the Balkans were for what we dealt with post 9-11. So we can talk a little bit about how this was essentially the, the dress rehearsal 
for operating in the post 9-11 Afghanistan world? Yeah, so it absolutely was a uh, dress rehearsal. And in fact, you wouldn't have known that I was a lieutenant colonel because we lived in the community, which was very unusual. And we grow our hair a little longer. And uh, we look... <laughs> We look like contractors more than army officers. No offense, I, I would have known you were a lieutenant colonel. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, or certainly you would have known we were somebody, yeah. right? We, yeah. But uh, we operated in the community and uh, it truly was a dress rehearsal, but the benefit for those folks that operated clandestinely and applied tradecraft, it, it was not lethal, but we didn't know the thresholds for maybe lethality. In other words, what was how were the Serbs going to react to us operating in their neighborhoods? How are they going to react to us moving through their communities, doing whatever they thought we were doing? Because we were certainly, from their perspective, working against them. Um, so we, our, our standards for tradecraft had to be significantly high. And it was very Cold War-esque. And what I mean by that is we crossed zones of separation from one ethnic neighborhood where we could operate because we were assumed to be friendly into another neighborhood where we couldn't operate openly and it was clearly not friendly. So that became a very good testing ground for how to operate in environments where you had to track people, you had to find them, and uh, you couldn't get caught doing it. In the police in the security services were working against you. If not actively, they were doing it sub rosa, underneath the surface. So that required us to execute our operations very carefully, deliberately, and the planning was, was crucial. And all of that learning became very useful for us post 9-11. It became a proving ground for how to execute good tradecraft in an environment that wasn't friendly and yet it wasn't lethal. Well, in some of that tradecraft, I think there's, there was an excellent opportunity to start practicing key skill sets that would come in handy just unfortunately a couple years later. Things like asset validation with a community of people where you can't tell the bad guys from the not so bad guys and understanding things like how to vet your assets, how to understand if it's a dangle or if it's somebody that's providing you with real information because like you said, you didn't know when the Serbs all of a sudden turned the switch. And so everyone who came to you with information could be setting you up for an ambush. Everyone who gave you information could be setting you up for disinformation from anyone from the Serbs to the Russians. And every time you talked to someone, you had to have that in the back of your mind because everyone looked the same. No, that, that's, uh, that's exactly right. In fact, um, what that required us to do, again, is the very detailed planning. It required us to ensure that we weren't compromised while we were conducting our operations. And uh, it required almost not an overkill, but it required a choreography that played out in great detail. One personal meeting with a source had to be planned uh, intensely to ensure that we weren't compromised because of the political consequences. Now, I've got an example. I think that's where we're leading. Um, this also refined problem solving because as many people here know, that's all that clandestine work is. Uh, tradecraft is, is tactics and uh, you refine that in the, in the space you operate and you assess lessons learned and it's problem solving. And we had a problem and the problem was we had a source that we absolutely didn't trust. We needed to get access not only to the source that we're just developing a relationship with, but we also had to get access to his car. But the problem is, we, his car problem, right? His car was so notorious that there was no way to get his car to a location where we could do something, non-lethal, something we needed to do to that car technically. So we had a problem. You know, so we choreographed an operation that uh, will sound very basic to you, but in the end it required a lot of resources, and it was intense in resources, and the objective was to get access to that car. So we essentially created a very good story to, to get this individual to drive the car uh, in the middle of the night to 
a nowhere road to secure that road. He was under surveillance the whole time, and he was to leave that vehicle, leave his keys. We contrived a reason why he had to leave those keys, a good story. He left the keys, and then he moved to another vehicle where we were taking him to a really important meeting. The meeting was not really important, but he didn't know that. The meeting was contrived purely so we could get access to that car, but we had a problem. Just getting access to that car in the middle of nowhere wouldn't solve our ability to do something technical to the car. We basically had to take it to a garage, our garage, in a secure location, a safe site. But the problem was we couldn't just drive that car. So the problem solving of uh, special operators, the problem solving of career intelligence officers, we figured out very simply what we would do is move a panel truck to that location, put the car into the panel truck, move the truck to the location that was secure. When the, when the vehicle got to that secure location, off came the uh, target vehicle. We worked the vehicle. The engineers did their thing in a secure environment. It was tested. Meanwhile, we were tracking the source while he was at that really important meeting, and we were racing against the clock because what we had to do is get the car in reverse order back into the panel truck back into the middle of nowhere. All that had to be done quickly, it had to be done securely, and that was the problem, and the problem was solved. Now all of that choreography was to set conditions for a very successful operation. A lot of work, it was intense, required uh, a lot of rehearsals, but it was just to do one small thing, but without doing that one small thing, we wouldn't have been successful later on. Well, you use the word rehearsals, and I think that's important because if you look at pop culture, you kind of just hear people talk about these kind of operations, it's that all the moving parts work perfectly fine the first time you do it. And that's nonsense. I mean, this is stuff you practice and practice. Even for something as simple as whatever you did to the car, this is something that has to be rehearsed again and again to make sure that it goes off without a hitch because Murphy's lurking. And if you don't try to work your way around contingency plans, you're in deep trouble. So I was mentored by an uh, at the time, he was a very uh, elderly gentleman, and he said, Chris, I want to sit down and give you the magic of tradecraft, so I'm going to share that with you. It's pretty simple. He said, rule number one is never, ever improvise. And then he looked at me and he said, rule number two is you better be prepared all the time to improvise. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> my interpretation of that was we always plan, we over plan. We make sure we build contingencies in everything we do. And that's consistent in the intelligence community for human to officers, but at the same time, serving in special operations with special, office, special, special forces officers and special operators, they have a um, really good sense for preparation prior to executing an operation. So what it implied to me is not only do you have to prepare for every operation, but you have to think through the uh, implications of contingencies. And I learned that very early on. And we're pretty good at that, I would say. Well, you were clearly able to apply a lot of what you had learned and what you had developed in human intelligence operations to help special operations forces in Afghanistan a couple years later. Um, you, you were deployed there, uh, not right after 9-11, because you were in another job, but a year or so into the war. Um, at a time when human intelligence for special operations had been degraded somewhat. The hunt for bin Laden had somewhat fizzled out. A lot of the resources had been redirected toward Iraq. So what kind of operational issues were you running into when you first went to Afghanistan? What was the trouble that you had to overcome? Well, so just a little context. So it was June of 2003. I'd just been a recruiting battalion commander. And I had a successful battalion command, but I was pretty much miserable for two years on the inside because I wanted to be in Afghanistan, but I had to motivate my troops. And I did that by telling them I'm like them, actually. I know that they want to deploy, but our mission, our role, our responsibility was telling the Army story. Not always happy to do when you want to deploy. That said, I was able to change command on a Friday and deploy to Afghanistan on a Sunday to serve with a special operation task force. That's very unusual, but I was by named to go into Afghanistan. So not only was I a little bit rusty after two years of running around in the United States, but at the same time, the war had changed because 
in 2003, a lot of our forces were focused in Iraq. The hunt for Saddam Hussein and weapons of mass destru uh, destruction, you guys know the story. But yet we still, we still had an enemy that was operating on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. We still had al-Qaeda senior leadership operating in that space. We still had a very lethal Taliban, and yet most of those forces were focused on Iraq. So I walked into a very, very small size task force, and my responsibility was to rebuild the human intelligence network. We were hanging our, our hat on a few sources, and candidly, those sources were not very good because we didn't have the capabilities on the ground. And yet, our mission was still to find bin Laden. Our mission was to f still find, find senior al-Qaeda leadership. And we had to do that in some pretty, pretty uh, tough places in southeast uh, Afghanistan at the time. So the challenge was to rebuild those intelligence networks, do it in the field with a very, very small footprint which is representative of some of the work that's playing out today with our special operations forces. So we included this picture because it's the world's greatest eyebrows in the history <laughs> of, of, can you talk a little bit about the conversations and who this is and, and how this applies to what you were just talking about, about building networks and relationships? So, here's another one. The, yeah, that, so, uh, that's an infamous warlord by the name of Pasha Khan Zadran. But it's very interesting because that was not a human operation per se. I probably wouldn't expose you to all the details of it if it was, but it's a good story because the lessons that I learned about uh, applying pressure um, that we learned in Bosnia from a special forces colonel that was a, a mentor and coach of mine, we applied in Afghanistan. So flash forward, uh, we spent a lot of time previously running around in uh, southeast uh, Afghanistan, as I said, doing what I call rural cocktail uh, circuit, if you will. So not going to embassy parties, but going out and meeting tribal leaders, and then peeling off certain members of those tribes to see if they'll cooperate with us so we can get access to, again, the Al-Qaeda senior leadership. All of that learning played out, and a few years later, as chief of human intelligence for Central Command, I had an opportunity to go back to Kabul and build a capability that didn't exist. And that capability was a human structure on the ground Kabul to work for General Barno. He was the overall commander. He didn't have a counterintelligence capability, believe it or not, and he didn't have a human capability. So all that experience previously on the ground in Afghanistan uh, allowed me to go back. I had some bona fides, I had some street credentials, and he said, I want you to build that capability. So this just happened to be a footnote in history, and I had just traveled with General Barno to Pakistan. I went to ISI headquarters, the head of uh, Pakistani intelligence, and uh, we had a meeting. Pakistanis don't like a lot of people in the meetings, and I was traveling with General Barno, and he said, no matter what, he said, you get into the meeting. And uh, I traveled about as close as I could behind Barna without being uncomfortable. And, uh, and he walked into a room and they slammed the door and I managed to get my foot in it. And uh, the whole time they were talking, the Pakistani uh, head of the service was talking. He would once in a while glare at me while I smirked and took very copious notes, which much to his chagrin. But that travel allowed me to build a relationship with General Barno. And we flew back, and later that night, about midnight, I was writing my trip report. I had to put together my notes. And um, what I discovered is Pasha Khan Zadran was getting ready to be released from custody in Kabul. And uh, we thought he was complicit in killing an American at a checkpoint because he was the tribal leader. Long story short, we couldn't prove that he was complicit. Nobody in the intelligence community could prove and demonstrate that Zadran was complicit in killing that American. But we were gonna release him. Karzai had to release him for a variety of reasons, politically and otherwise. He had to keep together these tribal coalitions. So we knew that Zadran might have been dirty. At the same time, 
I wanted to put some pressure on them. I wanted to put them on notice. Based on the experiences in Bosnia, I came up with a very quick concept, and I ended up briefing the U.S. ambassador. And Barno, General Barno, much to his credit, without a whole lot of bureaucracy, he said, execute the concept. And the concept was simple. Before he was going to be released, I was going to spend some time with him. And we were going to spend some time with him. We, Certainly we couldn't be threatening, that wasn't the intent, but we wanted to imply that we had control and we were unhappy with him and we were going to be monitoring, which we were, and we wanted to watch him. So his demeanor changed when he got out of the vehicle, you don't see that picture earlier, where he had a big smile on his face, he thought he was going to be released, and then we took him to a space which is where I spent some time with him, and ultimately his demeanor changed from happy Pasha Khan Zadran to concern Pasha Khan Zadran, and I became the spokesman for General Barno so I could message him. This was a combination of human, human dynamics more than human intelligence. But I said to him that day, the last thing I said is, I'll see you. I looked at my watch and I said, I'll see you in 30 days. And he said, I can't come back in 30 days. Al-Qaeda will kill me. It's expensive for me to stay in a guest house in Kabul. And I said, you know, Pasha Khan Zidran, with all due respect, that's your problem. I'll see you at 30 days. In fact, it's 3 o'clock. Come back 3 o'clock 30 days from now. Everybody in the intelligence community in Kabul was very skeptical that Pasha Khan Zidran was going to leave his lair and show up back into Kabul. The risks were too high. But we had messaged him that we were going to be monitoring his behavior, and we implied a level of control that maybe we had or maybe we didn't. In effect, we became his parole officer. And he came back 30 days later, and he came back 30 days after that. Unfortunately, we don't have great continuity uh, necessarily in, in Afghanistan all the time. So I can't tell you what happened subsequently. But I will tell you that worked significantly in um, uh, in the environment of Gardez, because then we had a way to communicate with him, and he became more cooperative. So maybe that's an illustration of combining a lot of learning, uh, some of the skills of being a human intelligence officer, and having a great team of people that could put together uh, very quickly a concept that wasn't exactly human, but it, it, it uh, had an effect that was very positive. So let, let's talk about an operational story while you were there. And, and one of this this is a story that I think is, is pretty extraordinary, um, and it shows where um, you had reached a level where you were working fully with other agencies, and not just necessarily American civilian intelligence agencies, but peripheral agencies like the Drug Enforcement Administration. And um, this is a story you've told us, and it is absolutely extraordinary, uh, because as a control freak who I am, I, I can't imagine you being in the position where you could not be hands-on. You actually had to watch this and let the people make the decision. Almost like a, you graduated to the level of understanding that you were now part of leadership. So can you set that up for us? So I'll skip ahead a little bit here. In the, uh, go ahead. So a lot, a lot of times we forget that the essence of good human intelligence and good counterintelligence, sometimes you have to operate in the shadows, sometimes you have to be murky on who you are and what your intent is initially. But in some cases, like Alan Dulles did in Switzerland during World War II, you just simply hang a shingle and you announce to everybody, hey, the new guys are in town. We do human, we do counterintelligence. So I had a day job, and my day job was to be that staff officer. I was the human chief uh, for all military operations in Afghanistan, and I was the counterintelligence chief for the same. And we hung a shingle, and we told all our friendly partners, all of our foreign partners that worked for the um, International Security Augmentation Force, NATO, for, for all intents and purposes, we said, when you have human to operations, you have to coordinate those operations with us, and you have to coordinate your sources with us, and we'll put together the operations. Because right now, everybody is, it's a free-for-all in Kabul. If you drove by Masood Circle, it was like a bus stop. There was a source getting picked up by a Czech guy. There was a source getting picked up by an American. There was somebody getting picked up by a Canadian force protection team. You get the 
you, you get the message. It was uncoordinated and it was a little ludicrous in some ways. So we wanted to put some order. That was our day job. So I said, anybody, and I'm speaking for General Barno, and I did that very judiciously, but I said, now I'm talking for a three star and you guys need to come to the table and you need to share your sources with us and we will deliver. That was the day job. At night, sometimes we did operations, but for all intents and purposes, we hung a shingle. And uh, that's when one of our interagency partners, an unlike, unlikely partner, a drug enforcement agent said, hey, Chris, here are all of our sources. These are drug sources, but sometimes they come across counterterrorism information. Sometimes they come across force protection information. Uh, so we, we want to work with you, but you have to deliver. So one night, Late, late at night, they woke me up and said, we've got something. We have a force protection threat. We know that a, our source um, has access to a guy that has two, two or three kilograms of explosive, and he might have a suicide vest, and he might be wanting to execute this operation on Friday. I think it was a Thursday. I, I might have said it was a Friday, but it was a Thursday. So uh, what I had to do is make sure everybody in the community in Kabul in the entire interagency knew that we had to put together an operation. And uh, other interagency partners had first right of refusal. And if you ask the question right, you get somebody to say no, and sometimes that's what you want. So uh, our interagency partners said, no, uh, we don't want to handle that. And I said, okay, thanks, we got it. And uh, the key to this successful operation, which I'll tell you about, was pizza. And what happened is we went over to the, uh, the ISAF headquarters, where a former boss from recruiting command, a one-star general, a special forces general, who I had a long history with in Bosnia, and then in recruiting command, told all the NATO staff or the ISAF staff, he said, whatever Chris wants, you work for him. Now, this is a little unusual because I had a U.S. chain of command, and General Fuller was not in my chain of command, but I happily that night just accepted the anointment from him, and he bought everybody pizza, and we started in earnest with the DEA putting together an operation, and the operation was going to take place the next day. And I switched role from a guy on the ground that had to help build a network by meeting in Kabul to then providing the command and control. And uh, the operation was essentially the following. We, um, we knew that this source could pinpoint the guy with two kilograms of e explosives. And he was gonna leave a mosque in the middle of midday traffic, much like DC traffic. He was going to leave the mosque and he was gonna have two kilograms of explosives and he was gonna take those explosives and he was gonna get on a bus. We didn't know what he was gonna do in that bus. So I sat in a headquarters a couple miles away, uh, controlling the operations. The Canadians were overall in charge, great individuals to work with. They completely trusted me to control the operation, work with the DEA, who were on the ground with the source, because they had the relationship with the source, right? So they were with him on the ground a couple miles away. We had Apache helicopters that were provided by the Dutch, and we had a quick reaction force that was to be provided by the Norwegians. By the way, this is the first time since World War II that the Norwegians were deployed to a potential combat environment. Now, they sub subsequently did some great work uh, since 9-11, but this was the first time they deployed in earnest, and it was to support this operation. So what happened was essentially the mosque let out. My DEA friend, Tim Sellers, was sitting with the source, and we had to make some quick decisions. He felt, Tim, that the guy who had the rice cooker, so the target of our surveillance, um, was going to get onto that bus, and he was watching this all play out, and he was asking me for guidance. It was happening in real time. The Norwegians were caught in midday traffic. The mosque had let out. Uh, we had a dangerous situation. We had Apaches overhead. And uh, Tim subsequently made a decision to execute the vehicle and do what every good DE agent does. And he tackled the bomber. Uh, not a decision I would have necessarily made, but that's exactly what Tim did. With great drama, he tackled the bomber and he held him down until the Norwegians arrived on the location. We had an Apache head, uh, 
helicopter sit on the crowd literally to move the crowd back because it started to become very hostile. So um, that's what played out that day in Kabul. And what's important to note, that simple operation then turned into a sequence operation for 48 hours more uh, of disrupting an IED network that was operating in Kabul. We painted a pretty vivid picture of this operation, but fortunately we have uh, gun camera footage from the Apache that we can actually show of this operation. If I can figure out how the hell to use this computer, we'll get it. That's not it, that's you. That's Christmas in yes. Iraq. And there's somebody here I won't here point out that here. shared uh, Christmas dinner that night, pretty humble. Um, a, great, a great deployment to Iraq. That's a hell of a crowd starting to form around you guys. Yeah, but uh, again, the contingency plans played out that day uh, very well. The Norwegians got to the location. We were able to secure the site. Uh, a lot of risk to Tim Sellers. Um, postscript to that story is Tim Sellers told the president at the time, it must have been uh, George Bush, um, he told him the story and he was subsequently awarded the highest rank highest award for valor with the DEA, a Medal of Honor equivalent for the DEA. And then we rolled into multiple operations that night. So let, let's, for, for sake of time, let, let's skip ahead a little bit. We want to leave some time for questions from the audience. And, and I want to start talking about uh, the job, af a job you had after you retired. Uh, because you retired as a full colonel uh, in the Army, which is, is wonderful. Um, but then you took a job with the Navy uh, as a civilian. And, and, uh, anyone understands the, the inter-service rivalries may be amazed that every former Navy SEAL you work with has nothing but glowing things to say about a former Army colonel. And, and it's amazing that they can actually speak in multiple syllables at the same time. And, and, but that was my first amazement. But the second one was the fact that they actually respected a kind of a ground-pounding, even though your intelligence, you know, a former Army infantry officer. How was it working with an operational group like the SEALs, particularly that, again, you can Google what DevGuru stands for. That group, in walking in there and saying, I'm a former Army colonel, trust me, because you were the deputy director at the time. So it's not like you're kind of some schmuck who's a, a, a low-level paper pusher. You were, you were, in, the, you were in the leadership. Uh, how did that dynamic work out? Well, first of all, I'm glancing out. I know there's at least one SEAL, and I was trying oh, I to figure out friends, if he was smirking when you <laughs> said uh, um, In any event, actually, the co competitive advantage that the SEAL organization that I was assigned to has is their ability to take the best kind of people. And if you don't, if you don't want to compete, in other words, you don't want to be a SEAL, and you have a skill set that's valuable to them, they are absolutely you know, the best possible force to work with. They didn't want to be a human to officer. They didn't want to do what I did. And I could deliver something that they didn't want to do. So that's a great symbiosis. It's a great relationship. And uh, I didn't want to be like a SEAL. I wanted to deliver for them what they needed. So it was a great six years at the command. Is this representative? If you look back at the Army of the 80s and the 70s going back into the Cold War, there was a pretty significant line of demarcation between the special operations community and the intelligence community. It, kind of everyone in their own sandbox. 9-11 annihilates that line. Is this, by putting a former Army human colonel in with DevGru, was, was this the acknowledgment of how dramatically things had changed since 9-11? It, it, certainly it was, but are, are we at that point then where we can say this line is gone for good? I think there was some of that because this was happening across the entire interagency. The idea of, of changing things up, the idea of being detailed to other agencies, the idea of uh, not being parochial, uh, 
Of course, there's always going to be parochialism, but at the end of the day, I really believe that that command that I was assigned to was very progressive at the time. They wanted an army colonel, a retired colonel. And Admiral McRaven, I should share, he's a tremendous leader, and we are going to honor him at the Webster dinner in November, uh, the Spy Museum is. He's gonna be honored at uh, one of our signature d dinners. And I'm very excited about that. Uh, but one day, um, at another general officer's home, I was invited to. Admiral McRaven caught me in the kitchen, and Donna just happened to be there, my wife. And he said, Chris, we didn't know it was going to work out, but we are really happy you went to the command. So I was completely flattered, but then I was horrified that he didn't think it was going to work out, you know, <laughs> right? I, I thought they hired me, so they knew it was going to work out. So. Um, they were very progressive, so they took some risk because they knew culturally it does shake some things up to take an army humanter and, and put them in a leadership role. But again, you can do that with a little humility by sharing what you know and the lessons learned. It didn't hurt that I spent time in combat with SEALs, that uh, I was very close to some SEALs that were killed, and uh, it was a long summer in 2003 from June all the way up actually through September. So uh, I already knew SEALs not only from Afghanistan but from Bosnia. But none of that matters because when you show up, you're expected to perform. And uh, I, I enjoyed my six years with the command. Sometime in the future, perhaps not the near future, we'll talk about springtime 2011 uh, and some of the, the things that happened with DevGuru during that time. Again, Google it and you'll know what I'm talking about if you don't already. Uh, but we can't talk about that today. What we can talk about is a job that you just finished doing. Um, so we'll go through some of these and get to, that's with Dev Grew doing surveillance training. There it is. Uh, maybe a picture you will frame one day and have on the, the bedside, or perhaps not, depending on what happens in the future. But uh, the <laughs> So the way the story was told, my mother told the story, is I'm the next vice president. <laughs> and. Uh, but really, what that amounts to is the 70th anniversary of the founding of the National Security Council. And we were all on the steps from the EOB, the Executive Office Building. And I just happened to get the best, you know, arguably the best position. And uh, I stood, you know, waiting in that position for about 45 minutes till POTUS came out. And uh, he uh, joined Chris Costa for the picture that uh, now you know the truth. But, uh, you know, I like the picture because the bottom line is my story for the White House is pretty simple. Uh, and there are people that still work there here, the intrepid folks that work day in and day out, 18 hours a day sometimes, seven days a week. None of the people I worked with were political appointees. We were all about providing security to the nation. We were responsible for counterterrorism. We were responsible for policy and strategy related to hostages. And uh, we did that nonstop. People from the intelligence community, which makes this position so enjoyable and important to me, because I now have the opportunity to responsibly tell people what it was like to work in the White House with intelligence professionals that avoid at all costs politicization. We avoid being politicized. And that's what we did. We fought against that tendency sometimes to, to be pulled into political discussions when our job, our job was to deliver the best policy options for the President of the United States. So although I look like a politician, I couldn't be uh, further away from the political dynamics that played out in the West Wing. And that speaks to all of the folks that work day in and day out over at the National Security Council. Our job in a nutshell last year in, and for the last 70 years was to just give the president options. And I will advertise this as well. And uh, I, I like to reinforce that counterterrorism ter played out extremely quietly last year. And the caliphate was in the physical space was defeated. Um, it disrupted. I'm not going to say defeated, actually, I want to retract that, uh, because they, they've gone to ground, they'll become an insurgent group, but they're significantly disrupted. What we did do su successfully is we took away the physical caliphate, and that was working with foreign partners, working with the Syrian Democratic Forces, and we, 
and everyone here should be proud of this, we were always armed. I was always armed with the best intelligence on the planet as a policymaker. The, I was always delivered the details that I needed to understand uh, by, in fact, I won't point her out, but my first uh, briefer f as a policymaker somewhere in this room. If you can find her, then uh, good on you. You'll make a good human to her. But uh, that was the work that played out last year, and I'm very proud of that um, in a very non-political way. So I'm asking one final question, then we'll kick it out to questions. And I just pictures of you with ambassadors, with you of head of Palestinian Authority. I mean, these are these are presidents and these are high-level people. And in that spirit, I want to ask you: the last year that you spent at the National Security Council, how much did you reflect back upon your time doing tactical intelligence and operational intelligence and understanding that you had literally gone the full spectrum? You went from the lowest level of an officer you can be as a scout platoon leader doing on the ground tactical assessments of maybe small units in the field to being a policymaker at the White House, and you did everything in between. Was that something you constantly thought of? Like when people were briefing you, were you able to look? Because a lot of people don't have that background. A lot of people can't put themselves in the shoes of their briefers. They can't put themselves in the shoes of those that are actually collecting the information on the ground, especially if they're the consumer of that intelligence. Do you think that gave you a leg up? And did it give you a perspective that others just didn't have? No, without a doubt, I was very well armed, better than most of my peers, and you know, I say that with all humility, and, and I was better armed because I had so many experiences to draw from in my role as head of counterterrorism for all intents and purposes. And I had a great team, um, but I did often reflect on, uh, on the learning that you guys just heard, and I shared some of that learning. I reflected on that often. I also knew I wasn't going to stay at the White House forever. I was either going to leave on my own terms or I was going to leave like many other of my friends. Like the guy yeah. in the middle of That's right. <laughs> who I, frankly, spent the other night with Mr. Tom Bossert, who's no longer at the White House. And it's a tragedy, or not a tragedy, it's, it's sad, you know, to see your leadership uh, leave. You want everyone to leave like I left the National Security Council feeling like I had accomplished something and feeling really good and being farewelled and uh, walked out with, with all your friends surrounding you. I don't know how they farewelled uh, Mr. Tom Bosser. Security, uh, probably. Yeah, I don't wanted. know. Yeah. But uh, I will tell you, everybody works hard in the White House, so you want everyone to have the kind of happy ending that I had, uh, candidly. But uh, it was an extraordinary experience. and. Uh, I reflected uh, back to the non-commission officers that, uh, that coached me over the years, to those experiences uh, in 10th Special Forces, my experiences in Iraq. I had so much to draw from. I had been in many of the places that we were talking about. My experience with the Kurds, and we didn't talk a lot about that, my experience of dealing with tribal leaders in 1991 and working with special operators on the ground, that came back all last year uh, in, in, in many big ways. So I had so much experience to draw from. So I used to talk to my team about the difference between experts and experience. And sometimes putting an expert before the president or some other senior might make sense, but they're, they're really deep on one subject. And there's some risk to that because you don't know where your leader is going to go with your questioning. So it's all of that learning and exposure that makes you so valuable when you have the experience. And my experience was extraordinary, not because of me. It's because of the learning that I did and the people I was exposed uh, to all those years. So that's kind of how I characterize all that learning. And it ended up the right space and place and time. But I never squandered that. Every day I went to the White House, I said, not bad, you know, for a kid from Natick, Massachusetts, without a dad, right? You know, I, I found myself at the White House, the most recognizable place on the planet to go to work until now, now that I'm at the International Spy Museum. So we'd like to open it up for questions. If you have any, um, you can raise your hand, wait for the mic. Shauna is back there so we can pick it up. Um, anyone have a question? There is one. There it is. Hey, 
How are you? Um, so my question is, I noticed a lot of human people speak multiple languages. Do you? If not, how did, were you able to get by? And if you do, how did you pick them up? So I don't speak multiple languages unless I've been drinking. And then I speak, no, just kidding. Um, but candidly, I couldn't study all the languages I was required to learn in all those experiences I outlined because the first uh, language I had to learn was Spanish and I had enough to, to get by with that. And then I was told, no, you have to learn Polish and you have to learn Russian. And then I was told uh, I needed to speak Serbo-Croatian and maybe Albanian would help, and I was ethnic Albanian and regretting not paying attention to, you know, as a kid uh, to all the, uh, the discussions that were ongoing in our family and not, less, not having a great language here. I was also told I needed to learn f French because that was a business language. I won't explain why, but the bottom line is I never had the opportunity to be immersed into a language I would have like to have done that, and it's critical for a Hugh mentor to be able to do that. But candidly, with the kind of experiences I had, uh, there were some times I deployed to places I never expected to be, and there was no way I was going to learn that language. And sometimes they were arcane tribal languages. But right. it is useful. In many cases, what you have to do is uh, you have to rely on your interpreter, but you also have to build in validation for your interpreter as well. We learned that a lot in Iraq. You have to test your interpreter, and you have to make sure that, uh, that you're hearing the uh, full scope of the conversation to include the context. So that's all part of being a human officer. But I never had the luxury of speaking, uh, flu having any fluency. Did that answer your question? Are you disappointed? <laughs> okay. Thanks you were, for the you were cool before now. Thanks, thanks for the question. It's important. And it went up here. You got the camera. Yeah, um, as Dr. Houghton uh, uh, mentioned, you, you have traveled, uh, Colonel Costa, the full gamut from, from tactical battlefield intelligence uh, all the way up to the presidential level. Uh, you were superbly equipped to take on uh, that, that role. So I wanted to ask you, what was the most challenging aspect of dealing uh, at the highest policy level uh, in the nation? The most challenging aspect is always that tension between policymakers and that dynamic I talked about, politicization. But what you have to do is you have to dig in. What I mean is you have to give the best policy output based on, based on the intelligence that you get from your briefers and what you process and what you hear and what you study. You have to get to the best output despite that underlying tension. And it was to lead through all the dynamics that you guys see at the White House. It was to stay steady and never forget the core values that you learned. And that's where Vince's question and my ability to answer it here, or my opportunity, I should say, to answer it, basic fundamental leadership is be true to yourself, be yourself, and uh, be steady, take care of your team, and you have to protect your team, but that's with some vulnerability. And you, you just have to do that. Uh, so you have to be a courageous you know, staff officer now. It's not on the battlefield. It's in a different place. But I think those tensions have, have, uh, have been present as long as there have been people giving policymakers advice. So it was leadership in an extremely, extremely challenging White House environment, a new administration showing up on inauguration day and having to execute. No one, no one gave me any time, nor should they have expected any time for me to ramp up. So you just had to execute on day one. What is your vision and priorities for the spy museum? <laughs> Great question. Thank you very much for asking about you the museum. You assume he has any kind of input on that. <laughs> there are a lot of strong opinions here, much like special operators, right? Everybody has, a, uh, has an opinion and there's passion. And that, those two things in combination make this a tremendous place to work at. But to answer your question, what I see happening is we will continue our mission of informing, educating, uh, 
and at the same time entertaining. Those three things in combination and much like the intelligence, the U.S. intelligence community, our role is to, to factually represent not only U.S. stories, not only U.S. exhibitions, but at the same time we have the responsibility to tell international stories and we have to be factual. So I see our fundamental mission being the same it always has been, and yet at the same time, we're a nonprofit now, so that changes some dynamics. But candidly, our education mission is the vehicle for going forward into the future and developing new partnerships. But let me share a vignette that represents how excited I am to be at the museum, and I told our founder, Mr. Maltz, this uh, not too long ago. On day one, I rolled in here. Like any new job, nobody cared entirely what your background is because you have to demonstrate your mettle. That's what you have to do. Leadership anywhere. You're the new guy regardless. It doesn't matter where I just came from. And I walked down the hallway, so on the inside, nerves. On the outside, there couldn't be any nerves, no sweating, and no uh, indications of any concern on my part. Uh, but as I walked down that hallway, my touchstone that day was seeing third graders studying the American Revolution, using secret writing as a vehicle to learn about the history of the American Revolution. And when I saw that, I said, that's our future, informing, in this case, third graders, but planting the seed. And uh, that is our mission. So I see that consistent with the, the museum's mission, what we've always done. We're just going to do it in bigger, in I think more efficient and effective ways because of the space we're going to have in LaFont. Does that answer your question? Shana, yeah. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Thank you. Um, back to the field. There are so many little subtle nuances of body language. I'm kind of curious to know, what is it that made you not trust your asset with the car? Um, did he prove trustworthy? And then with the warlord, um, in your dealings with him, uh, once he realized he wasn't going to walk away quite so easily, what kinds of body language, what kinds of subtleties did you uh, focus on, recognize, and then what? Well, candidly, I, I was not able to calibrate through the use of body language and neurolinguistics and all of the things that a good human officer is supposed to be able to do. I was never able to fully calibrate that with uh, Pasha Khan Zadran. It, candidly, we were unable to do that. So this had to be about being a, um, a, a probation officer of sorts, not using power, but recognizing my authority that I had that was vested to me by a three-star, and then testing him 30 days later. That was the test. With regard to the individual with the car, we employed every method of classic human to assess him, but he was just getting ready to betray somebody very close to him. He was getting ready to betray somebody else so he could betray us. And uh, he was a, a very, very rough actor, and he was opportunist. So we had to leverage what we needed from him, but at the same time, we had to do that with eyes open. So all of that evening that I described, all of that choreography was the start of making sure that we can validate the things he said he was going to deliver for us. You're welcome. All right, well, you can see why we are so happy to have Chris now here as executive director. Uh, his, not only his life history uh, makes for fascinating stories, but his experience is uh, something that we can certainly, we're going to tap into every day moving forward in the new museum and beyond. Uh, I already can tell you I take a perverse pleasure in asking Chris questions that make him uncomfortable. Uh, I think you did really well tonight. Uh, only three or four questions where I saw you kind of go, please don't ask me that. Um, so please join me in thanking Chris Costa, our new executive director, for taking the time to talk to us here tonight.